Good afternoon, friends. I'm Steve Benin. You're watching Israeli News Live, also doing an Institute of Biblical Research. And yesterday, I had done a broadcast called Blessings and Curses, uh, about 28,000 views as of today. And in that message there, I spoke uh, a little bit, a couple of things there. One thing I actually was able to share with you, uh, where Jesus, you know, of course, he said to his apostles that you are my friends. And... Uh, and then also how that Abraham was a friend of God. And oddly enough, in very similar parallels, because why? There was no mystery hid from the friends of God. So therefore, when they were considered friends, they got to see the mysteries of God. Now, as I did that, I also made a comment that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, another beautiful parallel uh, that identified who Jesus Christ really was, and that was the fact that when Jesus spit on the ground, he took and he molded clay, and I said he showed that he was the same God that formed Adam from the dust of the earth. And uh, But what I brought out is that actually in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the word spitting on, spitting on the ground, making the dust and molding it, is used in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So... And I didn't get a chance to show that to you guys, and I started to speak about a few other things there, and of course, my memory did not serve me as well as I would like it to, so I needed to go back, do some research once again, so I could share some of those things with you. And so today, I wanted to do that, do a message here, sharing those things with you, that I really feel like will be a tremendous blessing to many of you. Um, by the way, a little, little side note. <laughs> You know, weird things happen to us all the time in life. And I remember years ago when I first started doing this ministry here, uh, I hadn't quite started graying very much as of yet at that time, I guess about eight years ago. And uh, I remember looking in the camera one day and I noticed it looked like something had come off my nose or something and it fell onto my mustache there. And I actually got close to the camera, I'm like, what? You know, you guys never got to see that part, but, uh, you know, I thought, I'm like, is my nose running or something? Well, later, you know, I realized I was graying right in the middle on my mustache. Well, most of my beard is gray now. But today, before coming on the camera, I was, I'd walked into the bathroom, I was sitting there looking in the mirror, and I'm like, why does my face look lopsided? Well, it <laughs> wasn't so much lopsided, but then I realized that I'm graying all over to this side, quicker than I am on this side, still a little bit of red on that side, you know, and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, a little funny note there. So uh, let's get started with these things here, and uh, I'll share some of these with you on the screen so you can see those as well. Uh, we're going to start, I want to start off, though, in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 8 is where we're going to begin, and I'll try to go slow and very methodical with this and I think what would really be good to do as well before I get started some people when I speak of these things here think they'll think to themselves oh wow he's like a oneness or Jesus only type people uh, I think the United Pentecostals uh, are ones that say Jesus is God uh, and then the uh, Trinitarians will say but it can't be because uh, you know he prayed to his father well, I think there's more of a middle in, in this whole revelation of these things. And I think that when we recognize the fact that the Father dwelt in Christ, I think that would really help settle a lot of those issues that people think about. So even when we see the things that Jesus says and the things that, de that he did, he is the Son of Almighty God. He came from God. So everything that God was, was dwelling inside of him when he was here on this earth. And so if you begin to examine some of these amazing revelations that I'm going to share with you, I think that might better balance these things out with you and not just think, well, Steve's uh, this or Steve is that. Well, that can't be because... We believe the Trinity, you, you see what I'm saying, is, is to look at the, the, the balance that we have in here because truly we know that the fullness of God dwelt inside of Jesus Christ. He was the Son of God. And our Heavenly Father was His Father. 
but totally unlike any human that ever walked the earth. He was not like any human being. So there is a great difference when it comes to that. He was God manifested in a human body called the Son of God. And it is a great revelation. It's a great mystery, no doubt, when I, when I share those things with you. So try not to label me one way or the other because a lot of times people don't really quite understand where my revelation lies at. But in seeing that, that God was manifested in Christ, that's how I see these revelations that, like I said yesterday, when uh, he was the very one that was there with Abraham when he said he was the friend of God, uh, showing that type in, here on, on the earth. And we'll get into that as we go along. But I just wanted to kind of clarify that a little bit before we get started. This began John, Gospel of John, chapter 8, uh, verse 38. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Now, I don't know if you guys realize this or not in the beginning of this whole debate right here. Jesus clearly identifies that they are children of the devil. And as I shared with you guys before in the Qumran community, they realized there were children of Belial or Satan. They realized that there had been a mingled seed through the fornication that had been uh, conducted by the priests, the Levites. And this is what Israel was dealing with in that day. Now, in this whole argument here between Jesus and the Pharisees, you're going to see they try to accuse him of being a son of Satan instead. So I find that part of the argument very interesting, although that's not the focus of this message. I just want to point that out to you. And as he, they say there, because Jesus is saying, you're of your father the devil. And then they say, uh, you know, we be not born of fornication. They knew through that mingling of the seed, that's exactly how that happened. Well, Perhaps maybe the men that were arguing with Christ at that time were not, but it may have been their fathers that were born of fornication. So, because somewhere along the line during that 70 year stint, when the priests were over in Babylon, they took of those Hittites, Perzites, Jebusites, even Egyptians, and they'd mingled the holy seed and brought forth bastard children that were now Nephilim DNA descent. And as I mentioned to you as well that I thought was interesting is the Egyptians were also there in the Babylonian kingdom. And when we look at Ezra or you look at uh, 2 Peter, both Ezra and Peter, apostles of Christ, identify that even when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, that mixed multitude was a mingled seed like that of the times of when the, uh, the, the Genesis 6, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took into themselves wives. No, that was not Seth's children. Clearly is not Seth's children. And we know this because in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have a large portion of the book of Genesis, and we find out those sons of God are the watchers. These are your fallen angels that interbred with the women. Okay, so it's another reason why we have more proofs of that. So, let's continue on with this. Like I said, the accusation is going to go back and forth here. Jesus also says in verse 44, dropping down a few verses, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. 
That, that's pretty wild right there. He was a murderer from the beginning. That's Cain that was a murderer from the beginning. And he's clearly identifying them to be descendants directly through that lineage. We'll skip that for a moment, but this is what I find interesting. Verse 48, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Now they try to pin that Nephilim bloodline on him. Not that the Samaritans were a mixed race, because they were not. But it's interesting how they try to flip it around. Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father and you do dishonor me. I seek not mine own glory. There is one seeketh after judgment. Verily I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead and the prophets, and thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom, whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar likened unto you. But I know him, and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Watch this. And he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. All right, now, He's claiming here, this is Jesus Christ claiming that Abraham saw his day and was glad. He also claims that before Abraham was even born, that he was Yehaye. That's the I am right there in Hebrew, I am. Remember also when Jesus said that except that you believe that I am, you will die in your sins? That's what he said to the Jews. Now, he didn't say I am he as we see in the English translation. In the Greek, it clearly says, except that you believe that I am, not I am he, that he is italicized, you will die in your sins. So you have to ask yourself, then, who is Christ? And what else did he do when he was here on this earthly journey? Here he kind of says it pretty plain, but what else did he do on his earthly journey that we can find that we're leaving clues as to who he was? I've done many videos over the years about this, but I just thought I would kind of update it a little bit and share some new ones with you. Let's go to uh, John, the Gospel of John chapter 15. We'll start with verse 14, going through 16. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Now that's the key part about being a friend of Christ. When he's made known the mysteries to you, then you become a friend of God. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whosoever you shall ask, or excuse me, whatsoever you shall ask in the Father in my name, he may give it you. But knowing that you are a friend of God, Christ said about his apostles that they were his friends. Why? Because he had made known all things to them. Now, I thought that was fascinating in the fact that uh, we see over in Genesis uh, chapter 18, verse 16, 17, And the men rose up from thence and looked out toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that which I am doing? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. See, God didn't, hide what he was about to do in the earth, bringing forth this judgment, but he revealed that secret unto him. And thus we have in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, I believe it is, we have this beautiful 
passage, verse 7, Didst not thou, O, o our God, drive out the inhabitants of the land before thy people Israel, and gave us it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever. Thy friend forever. See, he was called a friend because he had revealed the secrets. And so therefore, when we see Yeshua, Jesus Christ here on the earth, and he's revealing the secrets unto his servants there, he now calls them, he said, I don't no longer call you, he said, or I call you friend because you're a servant. You don't, you know, he doesn't call them servants anymore, but he calls them friends. Why? Because he's made known the mysteries of God unto them. All right, that just that blows me away. Another ex interesting example, if we go to Matthew chapter 14, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, so the wind was contrary. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Walking on the water. Why would he just walk? Why did he walk on the water? Now, well, one, he had to get to the boat, but he chose to walk on the water. And I always thought it was fascinating because if we look in Genesis, now the earth was unformed and void and the darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters and God said, let there be light and there was light and God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness. But notice, who was it? It was the Spirit of God that hovered over the face of the waters. Let me share another one with you. Oh, just on that in itself right there. Give me one second as I can pull this up. <clears throat> because, again, it's the Spirit of God that dwelt, that, that hovered over the waters in Genesis. And Christ, and, and oddly enough, if you remember, <clears throat> when, the, when the apostles saw him coming, they were afraid. They said they thought he was a what? A spirit. Right? That's what they thought. That's what they thought. They said he was, is that he was a spirit. So if you go to John 14 and we go to verse 18, what does it say right here? It says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Okay, back up verse 17. Even the spirit of truth in whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. Well, I will come to you. All right. So he, that spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit that is going to dwell within the children of God that would be fulfilled on Pentecost was Christ's own spirit that he promised to dwell within us. And the fascinating thing is there Christ is the spirit of God as we see over here in Genesis uh, where the scripture says that uh, it was the Spirit of God that hovered over the face of the waters. Every place you see with Christ, there's a type and a shadow showing you who he was. And for the Jewish people, this was very important. Because there was supposed to be a prophet raised up likened unto Moses that was to come. As David said in the Psalm 110 and 4 and everything, that he was after the order of Melchizedek. The Qumranite community believed that to be the Messiah. The writer of Hebrews knew that there had to be another priest after the order of Melchizedek because David wrote about it. Over here in St. John chapter 9 we read, Jesus answered, Now they have this man sinned or his parents but that the works of God should be made manifest in him I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day the day the night cometh when no man can work as long as I am in the world I am the light of the world when he had thus spoken he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and he said unto him go wash in the pool of Siloam which is by interpretation sent. He went his way thereof and washed and came seeing. 
spit on the ground, made clay. I have said for years as a result of that, that that was clearly what we saw in Genesis chapter 2 when he says here in verse 7, Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God formed from the dust of the ground. Is that not right? Okay, well, here's what's interesting. If you take that, and then we look right here in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and this is actually part of 4Q264, so K4 of Qumran, from the Rule of the Community, fragment Q264, we read right here, this here on the screen, and I'll blow up the English so you can see it for yourself. Well, let, let me just first, I'll, I'll first read it, and then I'll blow it up for you. Shaped from dust has he been, maggots food shall be his dwelling. He is, he is spat saliva, molded clay, and for dust is his longing. What will the clay reply and the one shaped by hand? And what advice will he be able to, to understand? In the community rule, they literally write in there, that he was spat saliva. In other words, a molded clay from spit. And when Jesus spit on the ground and took and made a clay and put it on that blind man's eyes, I, I can't help but wonder, did the guy, was his eyes so deformed or something, or did he not even have eyes? I have no idea which the case was. But his actions were showing that he was there. He was the very one that formed Adam from the dust of the earth. And it's no unusual thing for the Jewish people of those days, 2,000 years ago, to, to believe the part about the spit on the ground because they were writing it on, in the writings in Qumran more than 100 years before Christ came on the scene. So all that he did were types and shadows. If we go to the Gospel of John again, and by the way, before I go that far, let, let, me, let, me, let me back up just one second here um, because we read these things and I don't want to pass any of this up. When, you, when, we, when we're over here and we're seeing, as we were just there, we were reading here, God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. All right? And uh, maybe that wasn't the one I was thinking of. Oh, no, 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 it wasn't. I'm sorry. It's back when we were in Genesis chapter 1, talking about walking on the, the, the face of the deep. The Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from darkness. I just want to remind you that even in that part there, that the light itself, we find in, in, in John, uh, the gospel, excuse me, John 1, I believe that's where we're at, yeah, John chapter 1, sorry, the gospel of John, the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made, and in him was what? Life. And the life was what? The light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. I find that fascinating as well, because when we go back to that Genesis chapter 1 right there, here it is, the Spirit of God is hovering over the face of the deep, and God uh, uh, over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And then we find out in John right here, in him was life, and the life was what? The light of men, and the light what? Shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So God divided in Genesis the, the, dark, the light from the darkness. I've always believed that there is more to that, not just physically the sun in the sky and the moon at night and the earth rotating around. I've always believed there was a much deeper understanding of that. Not to mention because in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, in him was life. And if we go to Genesis chapter 2, as we were moving on right there, 
It says there, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now this is talking about Adam. He says, But when Adam and Eve fell, they and their children lost the way or access to the tree of life. Now, I know some people have disagreed with me on that. They say, well, what? no, 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 no. They didn't take of the tree of, tree of life, not, not as of yet. They didn't have to take of it. It was given to them. The tree of life in Hebrew is called it Eitz Chaim, right? Verse 9 is where we see that. If you're looking at that, because I have it on the screen for you. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What is that tree of life? The uh, Eitz Chaim. What was breathing the astral's astral's nostrils? Chaim. What does John say in the Gospel of John, talking about this one, the Christ that was coming in the beginning was with God, and all you know, and in Him was what life, Chaim, and the life was what the the Chaim was what the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and in the darkness comprehended it not. Who are the darkness? The sons of darkness, even the Qumranite community kept calling these, these, these Pharisees and Sadducees a bunch of sons of darkness. They could not comprehend that Christ was the light. That's why I've always believed they say that this, this uh, Qumranite community there just disappeared. Maybe many of them ended up becoming Christians. You know, I don't know. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The saying came to, for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. But remember, John said he was not that light. But he was filled with that light. Because when Christ died on the cross and his spirit came out of him, that's why he had to die, by the way. In order for the life that was in God, he was the tree of life. In order for that life to be made available once again to us, he had to give his life on the cross. If you remember over in the book of Hebrews, it says when they're talking about all these great exploits of faith that Abraham and Gideon and Samson, all these men and women did in the biblical times, the women that received their, their dead back to life, uh, you know, all these people had died believing a promise that had not been fulfilled. And what's fascinating about that, some people think, what promise? It was the promise of the seed of the woman. It was Abraham's seed, a faith seed. They all had faith and believed about this coming, but it had not been fulfilled. They died waiting for it to be fulfilled. And some of those people, even like they, they speak about Isaiah being sawn asunder, you know, sawed in half. Well, Israel was already in the, 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 the homeland at that time, so it wasn't the state of Israel that was the promise. It was the seed. It was the coming of Christ is what they were waiting for. They died believing in that promise, but had not received it. So when Christ came, this is why we see it, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You know that when the earth quaked and everything, I think in Matthew's gospel, it speaks about the earth opened up and those that were asleep in the earth were rose up and came out and mingled amongst the living. Remember when Jesus came back after his death and he rose again, and he breathed upon his apostles, he said, receive you the gift of the Holy Spirit. Just like God breathed into the nostrils of Adam. And it was... Chaim, plural life, in Adam's nostrils. Why? Because Eve was in the same body. So there had to be life for both of them. But every child of God was supposed to eat from that breath or, or partake of the tree of, uh, of life. And that was forfeited by sin. All right, so let's move on. I want to kind of do this quickly for you guys. Uh, go here to John chapter 4. Now Jacob's well, verse 6, was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. 
For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would give him the living water. And again, what do we have in that type right there? Uh, we're going to end up going right back to Genesis again, but in, if you look in Exodus chapter 17, verse 5, remember what God says to Moses. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pass on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, and take in thy hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee th there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And the name of the place was called Massah and Meribah, because of the striving of the children of Israel, because they tried the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Well, this is what's fascinating. Now, two times Moses deals with this rock. First time, God commands him to smite it. The second time, God tells Moses to speak to the rock that it will bring forth its waters. Moses gets angry, he goes out on the second time, and he smites the rock, and he said, what, You rebels, must we bring water from this rock and everything? God got angry with Moses for smiting it the second time, because why? Christ was to be smitten once, not twice. But the fact still remains, though, that he had to take the elders of Israel with him, and judge that rock, smiting that rock, that it bring forth its waters. This is why the Pharisees, Sadducees, came together and they judged Jesus Christ. And when they smote him, they had to smite him in order to bring forth that water of life out of him. And out of his side, when that Roman soldier stuck the side of him with a spear, it came forth both blood and water from his side. That's exactly what happened. And his water and his blood were separated in there, which also the very type that was happening in the temple from all the sacrifices, when they would wash the blood off the altar, it's like a little thing that went out the side of the temple, a little, uh, uh, like a little uh, sewer thing or something, a little funnel thing went out and the blood and the water was coming out the side of the temple all the time. And Christ, just like the temple, because he was the temple of Almighty God, made by hands, not made by stone, he was smitten in the blood and the water come from his side. Uh, so again, another amazing, amazing thing that God did right there. If we look at John's gospel, chapter 20, then said Jesus to them, peace be unto you as my father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had uh, said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And whosoever, uh, who, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Now the point here was like I was mentioning earlier. That breathing upon them goes right back to Genesis again. And uh, where he breathed upon Adam and he, uh, where it says here, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living soul. Again, Jesus doing the exact same thing to his apostles, he breathes upon them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he was the same God that breathed upon Adam that he was that tree of life. That's what's so beautiful about that. He was the tree of life. He was showing who he was by his very actions that he did. It's absolutely amazing. Matthew chapter 26. Try to hurry up with these here so we're not too long. Uh, verse 21, And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he, said, and, and he, and, and he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. And again, that story there is in the story of Joseph. If we look in chapter uh, 44, verse 15, Joseph said unto them, What deed is it that you have done? Now, a little background so we know the story of Joseph. His brothers have betrayed him. They sold him out. We already, 
and, and scholars already bring out all those types about Joseph, and he's like Christ, rejected of his own brother and sold out by his own brother and goes into prison like his own brother and uh, his own brothers do, and, and, and etc. Uh, they've come down when there's a famine in the land to buy corn, and while they're there to buy corn, um, is they're going, Joseph realizes who they are, but they don't recognize him. And as, he's get, as they're getting ready to go back home, he, hold, he holds them over as spies, as if they're some kind of spies. And he takes, he makes one of them stay there while they go back to their land. And while he does, uh, he puts their money back in their sacks. And on their way back, they're stopping at the hotel that night. And when they did, they're one, of the, one of the brothers is going to feed his, uh, his, his mule. And when he does, he opens the bag, sees the money, and he, he panics. Well, that was also another beautiful type in itself, the fact that they discover their money when he was at the hotel. Because where was, where was Christ first rejected? He was rejected when he was in the womb of his mother, and she's getting ready to give birth, and they could not, the hotel would not allow Joseph to let her stay there for her to give birth. Instead, she was sent to the stable. But at any rate, as we move further down, because remember, Jesus said, one will betray me this night. And it's actually at the communion table where he's going to be betrayed at. And so as the story comes down in Joseph, his brethren come down the second time. He releases, I think it was Simon that he held in the prison, which that was interesting because his name means uh, heard. Uh, I heard. And so he releases Simon, and uh, they're, they're all gathered. They're thinking everything's going great. He puts their money back in their bags, but this time Joseph puts his cup in Benjamin's bag, which that's another beautiful type because Benjamin was not a part of what happened to Joseph, but yet the cup is placed in his bag. But it also shows a future part of the children of Israel because they would also end up being... Um, uh, the, the children of Israel later down, Benjamin would be involved in betraying Jesus Christ, who is the greater Joseph. So this is where the story picks up here. We're in verse uh, chapter 44, verse 15. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is it that you have done? Know you not that I am a man, as, uh, as I will indeed divine? And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak, or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's bondsmen, both we and all whose hand the cup is found. And he said, Far be it from me that I should do so. The man in whose hand the goblet is found, he shall be my bondman. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. And who? Of course, it was Benjamin. And it was during the time of Jesus that he's betrayed by Judas. And it was the children of Benjamin that were persuaded by the Pharisees to call for the blood of Jesus Christ. So it's a prophecy. And a lot of people just never do see that. Uh, there's so many things, so many things that could be said about Jesus Christ and who he was and how it identified throughout the entire Old Testament. We can see it clearly. But I think this will be enough for now. I trust it's a blessing to you. I keep hearing the dog bark in the background. I apologize for that. But God bless you. Thank you for watching. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live and Dinner Institute. Good day.